So how did we go from a live release rate of 64% at the county shelter in fiscal year 2012-13 to overwhelmingly passing a $22 million bond in November 2014 to build a new shelter to attracting national attention in April 2015. Tucson, if you're looking for love, we've got the place. News 4 Tucson is joining together with dozens of Pima County pet rescue groups for the biggest one-day pet mega adoption event ever. I sound like a car salesman, right? But I promise you guys, you will never, ever find more love than at this event. Adopt love, adopt local. Saturday, April 11th at the Tucson Expo Center. Isn't that great? <laughs> and I imitate her all the time. I think that it was a matter of three important factors coming together in late 2012 that got the ball rolling. The right place, the right time, and the right people. So let's start with the right place. Pima County, Arizona is 9,200 square miles with a population of close to 1 million people. It encompasses Tucson and surrounding rural areas. Located in the Sonoran Desert, we are blessed with monsoon rains twice a year. This moisture means that there are plants and animals found in the region that you will see nowhere else. Tucson is an island of blue in a purple county in a very red state. Resulting in a push-pull between conservatives and liberals, the Wild West and urbanites. Schools are closed for two days in February for the rodeo. South Tucson has a Greyhound racetrack, and horse racing takes place within Tucson proper. The city runs a zoo. The Arizona Sonora Desert Museum is located in the Tucson Mountains, and Saguaro National Park is nearby. Residents have animals. Depending on where you live and the local ordinances, you can have llamas, chickens, ostriches, small pocket pets, including ferrets, and many other critters, including dogs and cats. Pima County operates an open admission shelter on the west side of town that took in 26,593 animals during fiscal year 2012 and 13. The average daily census was 573, in a facility meant to hold 300 dogs and 100 cats. It often goes as high as 1,000. The live release rate of 64% was huge progress, considering that in 2007 and 2008, it was 39%. The shelter is also responsible for licensing and law enforcement. These divisions are also located in this building, were not part of the original plan, so they are using every inch of space. And I do have to say that I got a text two days ago. Um, the last two months, the live release rate has been 89.9%. So we're getting there. <laughs> the Humane Society of Southern Arizona, also based in Tucson, is not open admission and charges a fee to drop off an animal. In 2012 and 13, they took in 8,604 animals and had a live re release rate of 89%. There are about 75 animal rescue organizations in the area. Many of them were established to take care of some of the pressure, take some of the pressure off the county shelter, while others, like the Ironwood Pig Sanctuary, currently home to 600 hot belly pigs, were created in response to a specific problem. Now, unfortunately, there is the, the need justifies the existence of the majority of these organizations. But I also think that it demonstrates that there are a lot of people in Tucson who care about animals. So Tucson, the right place to make a difference for our companion animals because members of our community care. Now, there's nothing like a financial crisis to get folks' attention to help change thinking about how things should be done. Our rate of home foreclosures made the national news. Unemployment went through the, work, the roof. The demand for social services went up. 
The most vulnerable suffer during economic downturns, including our companion animals. As a result, people started to be much more willing to collaborate than they would otherwise. So now we need the right person. So this is Jan Lesher, who served as former Governor Janet Napolitano's Chief of Staff and then Chief of Staff for Operations at the Department of Homeland Security. She became Deputy County Administrator for Pima County and the shelter was in her portfolio. So in the fall of 2012, a couple of us talked to her about the situation at the shelter. She tells the story that I bought her a drink, which I did, and it worked. Jan agreed to call together a meeting of key community players, including representatives from the county shelter and the Humane Society, the Community Foundation for Southern Arizona, and a corporate funder, Tucson Electric Power. When confronted with the scope of the problem, these folks decided something had to be done and called a meeting of their peers. This was conversation at the highest level, buy-in at the top by the decision makers, people who could allocate resources, employee time, and inspire others to do the same. And it doesn't hurt that they got some kudos in the process. So November 14, 2012, Pima Alliance for Animal Welfare, or PAW, was born. So we've got place, time, people. We're off and running. I was elected chair of the Pima Alliance for Animal Welfare, and together with a small steering committee, we made some very important decisions early on. Everyone wanting to participate had to sign a civility agreement and adhere to its tenets. Egos had to be left at the door. Our efforts were going to focus on improving the status of our companion animals and saving as many lives as possible. This was not about you or you or you or me. Everyone was invited to participate and all participants were considered members. We wanted as diverse a group as possible to participate. Veterinarians, rescue groups, students from the University of the Community College, the CPAs, business people, attorneys, come on down. Pa would focus on three specific areas rather than spread ourselves too thin based on what the members saw as the highest priority. And within those three areas, there would be different ways to participate. Long-term, short-term, gifts of time, talent, and or treasure, all would be welcome and appreciated. Now the list of what we have accomplished since November 2012 is considerable, and this list that I'm gonna show you is not complete. But more importantly, we are changing the culture and inspiring groups to be creative, form other relationships outside the formal Pima Alliance for Animal Welfare structure, and just go for it. We do what we can to help, celebrate every success, and say thank you a lot. So I'm going to comment on just a few of these. If you have a university in your area, certain schools may be looking for opportunities where their students can get some practical experience. This is the case with Eller at the University of Arizona. The data that we got from this team working on our project for a semester has been used to help leverage other support and prioritize our activities. Everything we did right at our Adopt Love, Adopt Local mega adoption event, we learned from you at last year's conference. These statistics are phenomenal for a first year effort, especially considering all the competition for residents' attention that particular weekend. You'd be amazed at the list. So we did very, very well. There are a lot of successful capital campaigns taking place, and there is enough support for everyone to achieve their goals. And honestly, I was shocked that the shelter did this well with the challenge, the Rachel Ray 100K challenge, because it was held during the summer. Tucsonans either lay low and come out only in the morning 
or the evening, or they leave town. Everyone I know is in San Diego. We are very proud of this accomplishment, and we beat Phoenix, which always gives Tucsonans a bit of joy. And talk about an honor. We were selected for the Best Friends Community Cat Initiative. We got off to a very slow start because Pima County government had a steep learning curve and a zillion hoops to go through that they didn't anticipate, but we're off and running now. And so I've got 2,500 cats there. Dr. Kinski, who's here, and she's our vet, told me that as the end of June, it's 3,100. Yay. Spay or neutered, ear tipped, and returned to their neighborhoods as of that time frame, end of June. And she's planning a couple mega TNR events to help with those numbers. And all hands on deck to take care of cats uh, while raising awareness about the issue. So there are two ideas that I want to introduce to you today. And then I'm going to pass the microphone on. How many of you have heard about collective impact? Anyone? A few of you. Good. This is a model that goes beyond collaboration. And many funders are looking for opportunities to invest in groups willing to go deeper and aim for systemic change rather than simply conducting a program or activity. PAW is a collective impact model, though none of the partner organizations realize it. Our group has all five elements required for success. We have a common agenda, shared measurement, mutually reinforcing activities, continuous communication, and a backbone organization. Now that's where one member of the group willingly handles all of the back office requirements. In this case, it's the community foundation. That's worked out really well for us because we are neutral and have no particular agenda except community good. Uh, the PowerPoint's available to you. Um, so that you can read through the accomplishments, and I'd be happy to explain any of those in further detail if you'd like. But you can also um, look at these two charts I prepared for you, which I will say are the two worst PowerPoint charts ever, because they have so many words. And I'm sorry about that. Um, but you can download it and look at it at your leisure. Um, but I put, I put these slides together for you, because you can see at a glance differences between traditional approaches in grant making and collective impact. So, for example, first line there. Typically, a funder will issue a request for proposal, receive a certain number, and choose several to invest in. The grant is made to one agency, and the funds are to support one program. In a collaboration, a couple of agencies come together to work on a new project, or, more often than not, the lead agency drafts a partner to provide free space or staff member or to refer clients. That's not really collaboration, but they say it, they say it is. With collective impact, a relatively large cohort goes after some big hairy goal that not one of them could accomplish alone, like making Utah no-kill. When funders hear about that, they think, aha, now we're getting somewhere, and they understand that it's not a quick fix, but will require time. Now, some of you may be thinking, it's boring to be hearing about this after lunch, but let me refocus your attention. The people living in Ajo, Arizona, a town of 3,000, approached my foundation. They wanted to change their community from a food desert to a food oasis. As we continued talking, we realized this had a potential for very, to be a very big deal in terms of changing health outcomes, job creation, keeping older people in their homes, and much more. This is a very depressed town. Half the town does not have any employment whatsoever. Highest obesity rate and diabetes rate in the state is in this town, okay? So we said, OK, we'll invest in you as long as you use collective impact. They have. And so far, we have invested $350,000 over six years. 
The partners now measure community and backyard gardens in terms of acres, not square feet. Preliminary results indicate that obesity and type 2 diabetes rates are going down. Our investment has helped leverage two USDA grants, one for $125,000, another for $90,000 to support a farmer's market and entrepreneurial projects, and the Ford Foundation gave them a million dollars to refurbish an old school, creating a retreat center with a commercial kitchen. Okay? Collective impact is very powerful. And I have provided an article for you in the handouts for you to read more about that. I think that many of you are using the model now and you just don't know it. So I have this second slide showing the differences also. So I would encourage you to look at that. But I also want to talk to you about community foundations and encourage you to get to know the local program officer. Community foundations are a collection of local resources that have been pooled to support a specific geographic area. The program officer's role, my role, is to be one of matchmaker. I bring donors together with organizations. So the program officers need to know what you are doing in the community and what you hope to achieve. So that when a donor talks to the program officer and says, I am interested in animal welfare and asks for suggestions about what or who they should invest in, your project comes up top of mind. Community foundations can be helpful in many ways that you might not imagine. So I told you we were the backbone organization for PA. We hired a person who dedicates 15 hours a week to this initiative. She has a cubicle, computer, foundation email address, stationery, business cards. She takes minutes, organizes meetings. We foot the bill. This is a great gift to the partners, and it's a gift to me. So as you might imagine, not a lot of people in Tucson are really interested in writing a check to support the work of a government-run county shelter, right? In brainstorming options to overcome this, we encourage the establishment of an organization called Friends of Pima Animal Care Center. That's the official name of the shelter. A standalone 501c3 that could offer that all important tax deduction and would be responsible for how gifts were spent. It's similar to a school or a library foundation. Now, as you know, you don't become a 501c3 overnight. You have to create a board, write bylaws, articles of incorporation, establish bank accounts. It's a lot of work to get it up and running. Our foundation has a category of fund that's called a project fund. It is meant to be temporary, two years at most, but it allows fledgling organizations to begin to accept donations while they're working on every, getting everything in place so they can stand on their own. It's the only fund type that acts in some respects like a checking account. Since it's a lot of work on foundation staff, so we issue the tax letter gift acknowledgements, we review all printed materials, we enter into contracts on behalf of the little fledgling group, we pay the bills. Um, the fee is one and a quarter annually on the total assets and 7% on every gift. Now that may sound steep to you, but it's an incentive for them to move out on their own all the more reason to get that 501c3 established quickly. Money has been pouring in. $50,000 from a house party. This is a year less than a year old. $50,000 from a house party. $25,000 from a letter campaign. $20,000 from Arizona Gives Day. And $125,000 from one donor to cover four part-time staff positions. This is a very clever way around the county's hiring freeze. The ultimate beneficiaries are the cats, volunteers doing off-site adoptions, and people calling the shelter for help, help desk person. These folks are on our payroll, supervised by someone over at the shelter. It's a great demonstration project and a way to show the value of staffing properly to the county. And I have to tell you that about a week ago, someone approached me. They would like to leave a bequest when they're gone, $1.5 million 
to benefit cats. Okay? So by doing this work, you never know what might happen. Um, and we're neutral. We're a really great place to invest, and we make sure that it gets out into the community. So remember, though, that help doesn't always come in the form of a grant. Contact the community foundation and find out their priorities or the priorities of some of their donors. Ask for advice. Share what you are doing, who your partners are, the impact that you're having in your neighborhood, ward, town, county, state. The folks in Ajo got the state law changed so that food grown in school gardens can now be served in school cafeterias. That's collective impact. That's a wow that investors are looking for. And you're doing that kind of work. So after you've established the relationship with your program officer, if you would like to have that program officer call me, and I can talk about how great this is and how it would be a win-win for them, um, I would be very happy to talk to that program officer. So be alert for the stars aligning. Look for the right place, time, and person. And Francis, don't you love that Buster is wearing a no-kill LA scarf, right? Think, but more importantly, work deeper, longer. Together, you can make big and lasting change. You need to work differently and make connections with the community foundation. It's their job to know what's going on. By you talking to them, you're telling them what's going on. And an added bonus is that they can help identify others, maybe even donors, who love animals as much as you do. So thank you so much for letting me speak to you today. And uh, we're going to entertain questions at the end. Thank you so much. Thank you, Barbara. That's, I, I think, a good introduction in terms of what uh, we are talking about today, in terms of coalition building and um, how we can best work together to accomplish our goals. Um, I'm Arlen Bradshaw, and I uh, do work in Salt Lake City and work with our NK Utah Coalition, turning Utah into a no-kill state. I was nervous the PowerPoint wasn't going to start up, but there we go. So, um, so what is NK Utah? No-Kill Utah is an initiative of the Best Friends Animal Society that along with a coalition of 54 other Utah-based animal welfare organizations is designed to make the entire state of Utah no-kill by 2019, just four years from now. <laughs> That means that animals uh, entering the state shelters will have achieved a combined save rate of 90%. And I know most of you are, are very familiar with that statistic. And that means that 90% of the animals entering um, all of the state shelters um, are leaving alive. And I always point out that that is the, the floor uh, that we are working to achieve. It is not a ceiling, um, but at least 90% are leaving alive. So. Uh, when asked to present on this particular topic, um, I thought, well, we should probably see uh, what, a co what is a coalition? What does Webster, uh, the dictionary, tell us a coalition is? So uh, there were two definitions there. It's a group of people or groups that have joined together for a common purpose um, or the action or process of joining together with another for a common purpose. So the title of this session, I think, would imply that we, you have to make friends in order to coalition. And, and hopefully you are friends with members of, of coalitions you work with. But what's really key there and what really jumps out is that it's about a common purpose. It's about understanding the common goal and coming together around that goal uh, to have that collective impact that Barbara referred to. So what is not a coalition? Um, I, I just picked out a few things that... Um, clearly uh, would not be conducive to coalition work um, or any um, working together. So solely working independently, which frankly is what um, we, we have in a lot of our communities and we had in Utah before the development of our coalition. Um, a competitive mentality. Um, I, I, I always find it interesting within animal welfare where we all have these same goals. We want to save animals. 
um, but then we think we're in competition, <laughs> and um, uh, we, uh, you know, maybe don't uh, speak well of the other organizations or things such of that, and that's definitely uh, not a coalition. There's no leadership. Um, again, everyone's working independent, so there's, there's not a shared vision, there's not a strategy. Um, and what's particularly uh, poignant about that and what uh, Best Friends really tries to provide the NK Utah Coalition are benchmarks, goals, and measurements of success. Uh, because that's how we really know the impact that we are having and that by working in a coalition we are creating um, something together by really looking at um, what we are accomplishing through statistics. And that's um, one thing at Best Friends, or at least me, I talk about a lot are the numbers because uh, they're exciting when you start to see that um, needle move towards no kill. So a little a quick history lesson for you. So in the year 2000 um, was the beginning of our coalition work uh, within the state of Utah. And it was originally started as the No More Homeless Pets in Utah Coalition. Um, it was started by somebody you might all recognize. His name is Gregory Castle, um, and, and along with Julie Castle. Um, the goal was to bring together rescues, veterinarians, and shelters uh, to require that the state become no kill. Um, we started with a steering committee to direct the work of the coalition. And what's particularly interesting is uh, the, the original funding that uh, was put in place to start No More Homeless Pets in Utah, it had a requirement, uh, Maddie's fund had a requirement within their grant that they provided that a coalition be formed because Maddie's fund, very forward thinking, and they knew that in order to have the greatest impact, a coalition of all of the animal welfare organizations um, in the area would have that greatest impact. So how was uh, the No More Homeless Pets in Utah, what we call now the No Kill Utah Coalition, how was it formed? Uh, the answer is actually pretty simple. Um, successful rescue groups and expert individuals were simply asked. Um, from my understanding, Gregory just got a list and started calling people and saying, hey, do you want to do this with us? So uh, definitely not that difficult initially in terms of trying to, to share that vision and get, get people to start talking and working together, not unlike you know, Barbara's letter that they sent around asking people to get on board with, with the coalition work. Um, no More Homeless Pets in Utah provided the vision of the common purpose, which was to bring Utah to no kill. Um, there were benefits of membership, which I will talk about, that of course uh, made people want to join. So uh, not just a great idea, but uh, through the coalition and through that Maddie's Fund money initially, uh, there were some, some benefits. And of course, not everyone thought it was a great idea right, right out of the front. Uh, there definitely were skeptics. And um, my best advice uh, when you encounter skeptics is just to keep on trucking, move on by. Um, Hopefully, eventually, they'll come around, but don't let one organization or one individual uh, who is not buying into that shared vision stop you from the work that you're doing um, to build a great coalition to save animals' lives. So the No Kill Utah Coalition, uh, under that name, launched in 2014 to really reinvigorate the No More Homeless Pets in Utah Coalition and provide laser-like focus on the home stretch of making Utah no-kill by 2019. So it's based on the principles of honesty, integrity, professionalism, and mutual respect. And this new branding, um, clearly you, you are familiar with the NKLA brand, you can see it around here a lot, and the no-kill Utah brand is, is based on the same, but it um, is a brand that um, we allow co-branding with our members and uh, we have billboards throughout the state and it really helps uh, people recognize and, and even more so year after year um, recognize what this is. So we're uh, about a year and a half into calling us, ourselves the NK Utah Coalition and um, we really are starting to see the public understand what that means, which is also part of that collective impact. So our priority is saving dogs and cats found in Utah shelters, and in so doing, we believe that their interests are best served by cooperation between groups who share a common goal. Membership is open to nonprofit organizations, just as Barbara's Coalition, you do need to be a 501c3, 
or a government agency, meaning the municipal shelters. Um, and we're also very open to animal-related businesses that provide services that contribute to saving lives in shelters. So why form a coalition? Why is it important? Uh, no one organization can accomplish all of the work alone. Um, Shelters need a variety of options for getting animals out alive. Uh, you know, one of the biggest pitfalls I see in the work that we do is a shelter develops a relationship with one rescue group, and then that's the only group they go to um, when they need help with a particular situation. And um, as we know, um, those of you in rescue in particular, uh, you, you're not always able to help at that particular moment, and so you really need to uh, have a variety of options and um, you know funnel that out to a number of organizations that you trust and that the shelters build trust with and that's one thing we do in the coalition is help our shelters know that these are our reputable or organizations and they will um, take good care of that animal if you allow them to pull it from your facility um, and, we, and rescue groups already exist, right? So the, the coalition did not go out and start a bunch of groups. They were already there. What this did was bring us all under, under the same umbrella and work together. And uh, as, I, as I always talk about, uh, No Kill Utah is a statewide initiative for all three million residents of Utah, all 85,000 square miles. So we're not just focused on one city um, or one area. Um, although we do really try to support the largest shelters in some of our targeted work, uh, but if we want to support the entire state, it really is necessary to have a coalition just for the expansive geography of the rural areas that make up much of uh, Utah geographically. So to have an effective coalition, um, and I, I, one of our themes uh, of the conference is leadership. So. You really must have coalition leadership in order to be effective. Um, now, I do always point out to people, though, that um, NK Utah is a best friends-led initiative. We are not a dictatorship. We um, <laughs> do our best to provide uh, the information and resources necessary to accomplish the goal, but welcome feedback from all of the organizations and collectively make decisions together um, to have the greatest impact. Um, and that's important as well. If you're founding a coalition and you want to accomplish something together, you need buy-in from all those organizations. And if you don't request that feedback and have a dialogue about why you're doing what and when and how, um, it's not really a very strong coalition in that circumstance. So um, it's actually interesting. I, I don't know if she's here, but in my morning session that I presented in just on the work that we've done in Utah, a woman from Colorado came up to me afterwards talking to me about Colorado and how there are great places in Colorado that are really working to achieve no kill, a lot of great organizations, um, but there was no single entity that was really painting that broader picture and really directing where work needed to happen to have the greatest impact to help that state move towards no kill. And um, I, I, it reminded me again how important it is that we do have um, this coalition and that we do provide that leadership and, um, and that, that you know, we're fortunate enough in Utah to have Best Friends and Best Friends Utah to provide the resources and incentives uh, to get, get those animals out of the shelter to increase the noses out. So what are some of the be benefits of being a member of the NK Utah Coalition? So I mentioned some of the incentives, but um, two of the biggest are just our, our large events that get a lot of attention in the state of Utah. We do two super adoption events, one in the spring and one in the fall, that we have actually at our state fairgrounds that we have about four to 5,000 people attend. We do about 900 adoptions between the two of them. And in addition to the adoptions, which are very beneficial, those are great community education events as people uh, see the advertising and wonder why they might um, need to adopt um, an animal instead of uh, buy from a breeder, for example. Um, who here has been to a Strut Your Mutt? Familiar with Strut Your Mutt? Yeah, the Strut Your Mutt's now occurring in uh, cities across the country, which is really amazing, but we like to remind everybody that Strut Your Mutt started in Salt Lake City. And um, Strut Your Mutt is, of course, if you've been to one, you know it's, it's really just a great fundraiser. Uh, 
And it's a fundraiser primarily for our coalition members. So if you are an NK Utah coalition member, uh, Best Friends puts the event on, we put the structure into place, we give you a fundraising website, and you get to go out and recruit donors and raise money for your organization, um, which is really great. And of course, then we hang out for the day at one of the big parks in Salt Lake City, uh, walk around the park, and then have a festival. It's very, um, very fun. Um, of course, Best Friends also, we promote our members um, and the organizations that are part of our coalition um, through our website and social media. Uh, again, we have a Best Friends staff member who her job really is um, helping to get the stories and needs of our coalition members out into the uh, public dialogue and, and public spaces through social media. Um, we host an annual conference for our coalition members once a year um, and bring in national speakers. We mentioned we're competing with Jackson Galaxy in this time slot. And um, for our NK Utah coalition, Jackson came out to Salt Lake City last year. So they got some time on him and didn't have to compete at the Best Friends National Conference. Um, because he was one of our speakers for our own. And we do quarterly idea exchanges on um, particular topics that we might be struggling with um, at any particular time. Um, and we've actually even started uh, recently just having a monthly meetup um, at a, a coffee shop or a bar just in the neighborhood where our pet adoption center is to just make sure we're touching base with each other, just on a social level. It's not necessarily programmed. And I think that's really helping us strengthen our relationships too. So I guess we are uh, making friends. <laughs> so, um, And then we also provide stipends and grants uh, through the coalition from Best Friends. Uh, to try and address real gaps in our statewide plan. So we provide that leadership in saying, here's the goal, here are the numbers, and here's where we're struggling. And I, I, one quick example is we're working with a rescue right now on a relatively small grant, um, but it's a, a rescue in Davis County, which is north of Salt Lake City, and they're going to help us do kitten transport so that if uh, neonatals come into the shelter up there, they can quickly get transported to our kitten nursery in Salt Lake City um, and, and again, benefit that shelter. And it's, it's a simple thing, but it's you know, resource heavy for that particular rescue. And just because the shelter geographically is not close and they can't have their ACOs driving out of jurisdiction, it's just a small thing that we identified that is really going to help that shelter um, uh, to save the lives of those kittens. Um, and uh, we also assist with behavioral and medical resources. Um, particularly uh, for the rescues that have sh uh, their own shelters and for the municipal shelters, uh, helping them with uh, medical problems that they might have. Um, and the benefit of being in Utah, of course, we have the sanctuary there that has Dogtown, that has trainers. And one thing we've started just this last year is bringing trainers up from the sanctuary uh, to engage our coalition members and provide training so that we all have a better understanding of animal behaviors and how to correct them and make them more adoptable. Um, we also, we, uh, we have a spay and neuter clinic of our own in Orem, Utah, opening a second clinic in South Ogden, and our coalition members do receive discounts uh, at those clinics. Um, we do free spay and neuter surgeries for all pit bull type dogs and for community cats. Um, and for those of you that are familiar, I'm sure many of you and your organizations are members, uh, but if you become and are approved as an NK Utah Coalition member, that automatically qualifies you for Best Friends Nationwide No More Homeless Pets Network. So in order to join our coalition, we do ask that you uh, make an agreement with us that formalizes our cooperative relationship. And um, it supports our vision at Best Friends to bring about a time when there are no more homeless pets. And that agreement's important because it outlines the expectations and responsibilities for members in order to facilitate cooperation, collaboration, coordination, and effective communication between all members and with the public. The public is a very important component that we cannot forget in the work that we do. So our agreement states this, that all members of the NK Utah Coalition believe in the following. Um, adoption of pets from shelters and rescues instead of buying from a pet store or a breeder. Spaying and neutering all cats and dogs, preferably before the age of four months. Uh, we support ordinances that protect communities from any dangerous dog 
instead of breed discriminatory legislation. And in Utah, we were successful last year actually in passing a statewide um, ban on breed discrimination, which was very exciting and accomplished uh, because of the education and work of our coalition members in lobbying the state legislature. So, um, and of course, our coalition believes in humane alternatives for community cats, so we need them to say that they are supportive of our TNR work, which is an ongoing um, process of changing local ordinances. Um, we believe in wider access to low-cost veterinary services, including spay and neuter for low-income people. Uh, we agree to educate the public about responsible pet ownership, uh, cooperation between rescue groups, shelters, and volunteers to save more animals, that cooperation and working together, uh, you keep hearing that, but the, the most important bridge in that uh, sentence is cooperation between the shelters and the rescues. Um, and we support microchipping for all cats and dogs so that they can um, be returned to their owners. We also commit to provide, um, the coalition members provides two best friends Utah, their monthly intake and save rate statistics because that helps us again gain a broader vision and picture about what is happening throughout the state. And so we need to know the numbers that are coming into your rescue, how many adoptions you're doing, um, how many spay and neuter surgeries you've supported so that we can strategize uh, statewide and we just need that information to flow freely. Um, our coalition members commit that they will only adopt out sterilized animals. Uh, again, must be a 501c3 and in good standing with GuideStar. And um, we do ask that our rescues, however, um, maintain that lifelong commitment to any animal that they adopt out. So um, accepting returns is a crucial uh, part of being an NK Utah coalition member and a crucial part um, to making Utah a no-kill state. And then uh, finally, we also uh, require that, uh, again, as we work with the coalitions to um, better their relationship with shelters, we want to ensure that they provide appropriate daily care to all animals under the care of their organization, including animals in foster homes or other offsite locations. And what that means is that my coalition manager um, does sometimes have to do site visits out to the facilities of um, coalition applicants so that we feel confident when we tell shelters that these are great groups to work with, that we know that that really is the case and that they've committed um, to provide that highest standard of care. Um, they have to ensure that no animal in their care or custody um, is used for breeding or any breeding purposes. Um, I think we all know why that is. And then be actively involved in the work toward the goal of a no-kill Utah. So uh, just in sum, uh, what we've accomplished through our coalition work is that 33 local shelters in Utah have achieved no-kill. Um, before the coalition began its work in 2000, uh, 46,000 uh, animals, dogs and cats were being killed in Utah each year and last year that was, we have reduced that by 71% to 14,000. And uh, collectively our coalition members have supported close to 122,000 adoptions uh, in that time span. And just last year 6,500 animals were transferred out of the shelters uh, to NK Utah coalition members. And uh, just finally, Last year was the first year statewide that we achieved no kill for dogs. We had a 92% save rate for dogs in 2014, so let's hear it for that. And uh, we do still have work to do for our feline friends, but I thought I'd hot off the presses. These are our year-to-date numbers. Um, we're headed into summer, which we all know is, are the difficult months, but so far uh, in 2015, we have a 94% statewide save rate for dogs, 75% for cats, and so combined, we're at 86% statewide uh, throughout all 29 counties in Utah. So very exciting, and um, I will uh, get out of the way so that Francis can impart his wisdom on us. But there is, um, whoops, my contact information. Uh, if you want to jot it down, or I also have uh, cards available that I'll hand out afterwards. So, we're good. Come on up. I don't want to reiterate a lot of the things that Arlen was saying, because they're obviously best friends. Uh, Los Angeles, uh, Utah, a lot of similarities, a lot of the same requirements related to uh, the technicalities of participation. But some background, I think, would be interesting on uh, the... Uh, genesis of NKLA. 
Best Friends, uh, we started working in Los Angeles really in the early 1990s. Uh, and it was when Best Friends was in pretty rough straits. And most of our work there at the time was fundraising. But we started uh, small programs. It was principally led by uh, my wife, Silva, and myself. We built uh, memberships and volunteers and uh, hosted events and were uh, built relationships with the community over time. And you know, some loved us, some hated us, but generally we had good, good uh, relationships with folks. Uh, and one of the things that we did uh, that we started doing, uh, and we didn't invent uh, super adoptions in Los Angeles, but we kind of perfected the kind of models that we use and which then picked up by the organization generally. And a super adoption is a very interesting uh, point of reference for a, uh, a coalition. It doesn't define a coalition or create a coalition, but uh, for that day and those moments and those hours, the weekend, that you are uh, working together, uh, you have, in a sense, a de facto coalition the default, by virtue of the fact that you are all working to the same goals. You're working to support the shelter. You all have shelter animals. You're all, uh, at the end of the day, you are trying to make sure that none of the animals return to the shelter, that everyone is saved. Uh, it's a bit like having a uh, stock exchange. You know, I can take that. No, you take that. We're going to do this. It's a, it's a really interesting high energy uh, situation. Uh, so there's a, when I told this to a friend of mine who was a business person. He said, oh yeah, well, that's like, uh, you know, you have uh, one Italian restaurant and uh, one opens across the street, that's competition. And that was kind of a reference to the fact that within animal welfare there is this, uh, had been, certainly in Los Angeles, this sense of competition, this, this zero-sum sense that, you know, if, if a dollar goes to you, it doesn't come to me. If you get the adoption, then I lose the adoption. So those kind of, that sort of thinking is very sort of detrimental to our movement, but also totally antithetical to the idea of a coalition. And uh, so the analogy, say you have one Italian restaurant and one opens across the street. Well, then you have competition. 20 Italian restaurants open up and you have Little Italy. And that becomes an attraction in itself. And so what these uh, super adoptions demonstrate is the, the multiplied effect of this group activity. So you have uh, as many as 50 organizations as we have had in Los Angeles in the park with you know, 1,500, 2,000 dogs and cats and sometimes parrots and uh, other you know, creatures. We've got horse uh, adoption programs there. But what it happens is that that uh, collective activity becomes something else again. It's not just uh, a couple of folks doing a pet adoption, it becomes a community event, and the community event attracts people. It elevates the awareness of the cause. It brings new people in. It brings new volunteers in. So that little example of the weekend super adoption is a great model for a coalition, because ideally that's what the coalition is about. It's creating something that's bigger than the whole of the sum of its parts. So. When uh, we had been working in Los Angeles for a long time, from 2000 to 2001 to 2010, Los Angeles was in a lot of turmoil, particularly with regard to uh, the animal uh, services. So LA Animal Services, Los Angeles, a city of about almost right on four million, just a bit under the latest count. Uh, it's uh, about 55 miles from north to south, about 34 miles east to west at its longest point. And it has a, such a diverse, a multifaceted city. It's one of the, has a big port, it has uh, communities that, in which English is not spoken at all. You have 25% of the population is below the poverty line. Uh, there are serious inner city problems and concerns. And also uh, there's enormous, uh, wealth and media potential and entertainment potential. So it's a very interesting city and we felt that both from the fact that it was our largest membership base and it was we really needed to give back to the city, it was also a, a challenge and it was a, a challenge that also represented uh, the, the sense of possibility that if you can do it in Los Angeles you can really sort of do it almost anywhere. 
and the fact that Los Angeles is a trendsetter. Ideas and, and things sort of germinate out from Southern California through the media and uh, participation of celebrities, a variety of, of things. But uh, you've seen you know, people wearing NKLA t-shirts in People magazine, celebrities uh, out with their pets wearing a, you know, a, all of that is something that then spreads the idea and germinates this sense of, of the, uh, the coolness, the, the appropriateness, and the kind of energy around uh, animal welfare. So uh, let me see if I can do this. I think I can. Where's that guy? Here it is. Uh, so this was the NKLA founding members. And we selected, uh, you know, there's a lot of infighting and had been a lot of infighting in, uh, in animal rescue for a long time. And so that even within this group, and we selected uh, two leading agencies that were uh, uh, involved in dog rescue, two agencies involved in uh, both one in community cat work and the other in, in cat adoptions, and two principally principal spay, or, spay neuter organizations, Fixed Nation and Found Animals. Found Animals has since uh, become a much more diverse and uh, extensive organization involved in all sorts of things, but at the time their principal work uh, was uh, they were uh, helping to resuscitate several spay neuter operations and Amy Gilbreth, who was the uh, rep for uh, and the, the CEO, uh, general executive director of Found Animals, uh, was really running like three uh, spay neuter operations at the time. So that represented a, a diverse uh, cross-section of the animal welfare community in Los Angeles. And folks like Stray Cat Alliance connected with a whole different universe than, say, the kitten rescue folks did, because they were all the trappers. Uh, downtown Dog was really a, an inner city, a nitty-grit, very uh, down-to-earth organization that connected right into the heart of, plugged into the heart of the city, and also connected with a variety of, of rescue organizations. Likewise, Karma and uh, Fix Nation, et cetera. So these were not just representatives, but they were a, a bridge to other organizations. So that was the, the reason for bringing to starting with that. And again, uh, the guiding, basic guiding principle was no bash, no trash. We sort out our differences here. We sort out our differences amongst ourselves. We don't bash animal. The, the LA Animal Services uh, when, some, when something happens that we don't like or we want to see change. We talk, to, we talk. Uh, we don't go publicly, we don't go into the streets. We, we sort out our differences amongst ourselves. That started uh, in, our first meeting was in December of 2010, shortly after uh, Brenda uh, was uh, hired as the uh, general manager of LA Animal Services. And, you know, this was, it was kind of tense. It was sort of a standoff. We'd been, people had been talking about Los Angeles being no kill for a very long time. And everything, nothing sustained. Uh, everything fell apart. There was no leadership. Uh, and at the same time, again, we, when Brenda came, she was the seventh general manager, interim or permanent, uh, that had been in Los Angeles since 2001. So in that nine-year period, we went through seven general managers. And some of them were driven out by rescues. Some of them were driven out by staff. Some of those. So you had a situation where the, uh, both LA Animal Services and the community was kind of like, it seemed unmanageable. It was chaotic and ungovernable. Uh, and it was really, it was just to the detriment of the animals. Brenda came in and she had uh, the credentials from, animal, from her work with Rich Avanzino in San Francisco, her work in Seattle and various places. She had solid uh, credentials in no-kill. And that brought kind of a, a, a truce, a piece that we were able to exploit to pull this together. Uh, and so that group is now 97 organizations. So in three years, it went from uh, when we launched in 2012, uh, we, that's what we started with. This started in 2010, 
end of 2010. We spent most of 2011 designing our programs, adopting and adapting a lot of the things that were happening in, in, in Utah that we'd been previously done, doing with um, No More Homeless Pets in Utah, and consulting with all the different organizations, pulling things together, pitching the city council, a variety of things that really the background work needed to be done, and also a lot of data work. I mean, huge amount of data work. But that now is a, a group of 97 organizations. And uh, so why Los Angeles? Well, Los Angeles, as I said, it's a trend-setting city. Uh, it was somewhere that had, has a major base of support for best friends. And again, we felt that if it can be done there, it can be done any place. I want to uh, see if I can get this thing to run. Uh, so this didn't run last night. If you're at the, uh, the uh, tracks to No Kill or past to No Kill that we had earlier with the NKLA, I had this. We are the best friends of animals. We are a movement. We are a coalition of organizations and passionate individuals dedicated to making Los Angeles a no-kill city. Last year, more than 17,000 healthy or treatable animals were killed in LA city shelters. Each one an individual. Each one a loving pet worth saving. 17,000. That number should be zero. And it can be. There is a solution. But only if the people who care work together. Join us and help make LA into NKLA. So that was our manifesto, and that was accompanied our launch of the campaign. Uh, the numbers that you heard in there uh, when we started our baseline year, what we took as our measurements of what we're comparing what to was 2011. About 56,000 animals came into the shelter. Uh, 23,000 died. 90% uh, of, if we'd had a 90% save rate, we would have had to save 17,000 more animals. That's where the 17,000 came from. And again, as Arlen said, that's a threshold. It's not the end of the story. But that was the benchmark that we were using in order to communicate to the public what our what what the gap we were trying to make up was. So from 23,000 animals being killed in uh, 2011, three years later, that number is down to 12,000. So big progress is being made. And how do we go about doing that? Well, a coalition. We can't do this alone. And in order to uh, get that work going, uh, as in with uh, providing uh, the space, the advertising, the promotion, the campaign, everything for a super adoption, the coalition uh, is Run, operates the same way. Best Friends uh, was able through our resources to fast track adoptions by uh, incentivizing adoption. So again, it was a baseline measurement. If uh, Arlen's Rescue had 10 adoptions last year in 2011 and they did 15 adoptions in 2012, well then we would give them uh, $150 for each of those five additional uh, adoptions. And the next year, they'd have to get above that level, and, uh, and again, and again, and again, and that's still carrying on. We also targeted a high-volume spay-neuter for low-income communities. And again, uh, in some places in Los Angeles, you, you, know, you uh, hear of means testing or people having to prove their, their, uh, that, you know, I can't afford this, here's my, whatever you call it, you know, my, uh, what are those? Yeah, W-2 or the thing there where they have children benefits for certain things or they're on a certain, you know, the demonstrate their income. In some communities, you know, people can't even prove that they live in a, in a community because they are, they're living in the garage or they're living in a car or in the basement. They're not the primary owner. The bills aren't made out to them. They're not, uh, they're not uh, on, they almost don't exist. So anybody who turns up with, you know, a piece of junk mail addressed to them, anything that indicates that they are in a zip code that, is kind of one of these 75% or 85% below the poverty line, you qualify. We're not trying to keep people out, we're trying to get people in. So uh, both economic and geographical uh, targeting of spay neuter was uh, one of the things that we did. And then a comprehensive advertising campaign that included not just the uh, 
things like that, PSA, but uh, citywide uh, outdoor billboards, uh, digital campaign, banner ads, a variety of things like that. So we wanted to build the capacity in adoptions, and we, again, measuring results is incredibly important. And that's where the co you know another very important feature of the coalition is, is, and the sense of participation is that everybody is feeding information into the same source. Now, fortunately, in Los Angeles, uh, they had a something called the New Hope Partners. Uh, they were people who had signed up to be uh, have access, more ready access to the animals that were for adoption or that had been uh, cleared to be moved to rescue. And so they had already put their, they were already 501c3s, they were already registered with the city. They had uh, to be, have this preferred re adoption relationship with the city uh, services, animal services. Uh, they were also required to put, give their uh, adoption results on the animals that they uh, pulled from the city. So there was already a, a, a data collection system going on and we just tapped into that, which made our work easy and also made the coalition partners lives easier because they didn't have to tell, you know, do double reporting to the city and then to best friends. So we obviously were looking to the future, but you need to take care of the animals uh, here and now. And again, with the spay neuter targeting underserved com uh, communities, geo and economic targeting. And here are some of the kind of outdoor ads that were developed by TBWA. And this is interesting. TBWA are the folks, if you uh, ever see the Apple campaign, they are the folks who designed the Apple ads and the Apple marketing campaign. The, if you ever read Steve Jobs' book, uh, there's a whole chapter in it on this guy named Lee Clow, who's the, the genius behind their uh, TBWA, and he's regarded as one of the, you know, literally advertising genius he's re recognized around the world. He's kind of semi-retired, but he has, still pays attention to two campaigns. One is the NKLA campaign, and the other is Apple. So we're in good company. And again, that's part of a coalition. A coalition is, isn't just the people who are doing the work. The coalition goes out and includes the elements of the community. So uh, having that, those resources has been a, in a tremendous benefit. They were on bus sides. And so all of this was part of driving public awareness. What's going on here? What are we doing? Uh, um, and here's this. Hi, I'm Kevin Nealon. I'm here to talk to you about gonorrhea. And I'd like to talk to you about lazy ear. I would like to talk to you about infantile baldness. I'm Kevin Nealon, and sadly, some people will already have forgotten who I am. And I'm here to talk to you about Common the problem with whole Canadians. The problem is getting there worse. are too many whales. And worse, this affects but all mostly of us. you. I'm Kevin Nealon. I'm here to talk about trench the mountains. Glaciers. Today, I would like to talk Overrated about bulimic insomnia. Backwards baseball. Hats. Raise awareness. Lower expectations. Go to your ATM. Talk to him. And I'm here to talk to you about facial Double sided cat hair rollers. Don't just sit Complain. there. Complain. Can you be that Plastic trichinosa fopala. It's an unfixable People problem. Like Tobin, you F can't fact. smell it. You can't hear it. 3D. You can't imagine. And you are to blame. Probably know an out-of-work astronaut. Time is running out. Skateboarding in Proper hospitals. Proper deodorant application. Plaid malaria. Doctors without underwear. Kangaroo impotence. I don't mean to scare Texting you. while scuba diving. read my lips? BYOB. Northern Ireland. Y2K. Mongolia. Every day. Tampa Bay. Jars of clay. Nail biting. Bad posture. Turf toe. Fanny packs. Crack. I'm Kevin Nealon. There are a lot of problems out there. And unfortunately, we can't do much about a lot of them. But here's one you could do something about. Homeless pets. Spay and neuter your dog or cat, or adopt them from an animal shelter. It's that easy. Go to nkla.org to find out more about how you can help, and let's solve this problem. Let's make Los Angeles a no-kill city forever. I don't know if you could hear it, but the dog growled at him when he was <laughs> So, and that's again, you know, part of this idea of coalition building. You know, you bring in people like Kevin Neal, and we've had a tremendous uh, response from the entertainment community, and we've had uh, PSAs from, you know, the gal who's on uh, True Blood, uh, and, you know, Kristen Bauer, uh, Amy Rossum, Emmy Rossum, a variety of folks that, that love animals. And, there are, and the thing is that, you know, a celebrity, these are national celebrities, but every community has celebrities. And sometimes it's a local football coach. Sometimes it's uh, the sports star. Sometimes it's a 
somebody who's on the radio or in the newspaper. So you know, don't think of celebrities as just people who uh, are world famous. There are local celebrities and people who can help be spokespeople for your, what, what you're doing. So uh, the coalition involves building trust. And it doesn't all happen overnight. You know, and especially if you're building something where uh, you have you, you, a lot of facts on the ground, a lot of existing work that's being done, a lot of competing organizations, or in their mind they're competing. And so, you know, like we did our first sit-downs with folks, as I said earlier, it was pretty, it was like detention class. You know, there's a very cold environment that we, we brought these folks together and it's sitting everybody sort of, well, you know, I don't know, we, you know, I remember when we had that argument back and, you know. So, but then you start working on things that you, you're looking forward and you're building new relationships and new things to talk about and all that stuff tends to drop away. So you don't have people sitting there, you know, looking at their, their shoes in the middle of the meeting. You have really people engaged. And now it's like really everybody's on track, everybody knows what they're doing in really exciting work. So we are running late, so we just have a few minutes, 15 minutes for Q&A. So I'm gonna drop that there and invite uh, my co-presenters up and maybe we can answer some of your questions. My question is for Barbara. Um, as a donor of my lo in my local community foundation, how can I engage the staff there to get more involved and be a more visible presence in the local animal rescue community? As an example, um, a few months ago, I attended a luncheon where various uh, members of organization that helped the homeless population were in attendance. They talked about what they were doing and tried to you know, engage donors. I would love to see something like that in my community for um, animal rescue organizations, particularly here where we're starting a no-kill movement. Do you have any suggestions or advice? So, uh, am I understanding you're a donor to that community foundation? Yes. Hello. Yes. <laughs> so, um, there has to be a program officer. That's where I would start, is the program person. Okay. Um, and talk to them about what you are doing because it's their job to know what's going on. And a community foundation, what's really makes it different than a lot of other foundations is it has to represent the entire community. So they can't just make grants in a small, narrow area, like emergency services or something like that. They have to be making grants and making funds available across the board. So um, if they don't have a strong presence in that particular area, you need to bring it to their attention and tell them about how great this is um, and, and get them to come to a few meetings or get to know some other folks. Think about that. Listen to them, but also share. They'll, they'll do something. Yeah, they can call me. I, I was gonna comment quickly <laughs> on, on the Community Foundation for Utah actually does a annual competition among all the nonprofits in the state. And you, uh, people can go donate directly to your nonprofit. And for every person that donates at least $10, it's a competition for community foundation grants. And they do it in different categories, large, medium, and small. And what was really great when we did this just this last year, um, in the large nonprofit category, the number one winner, winner was the Humane Society of Utah, and Best Friends was second. Um, and in the small category, a nonprofit that supports just the Salt Lake County Shelter won. And so it's, it's interesting that not, um, they didn't plan it that way, <laughs> um, but, but the community clearly said we care a lot about these animal-based nonprofits. That's what that says. And so we have um, Arizona Gives Day, and you look at that, and the groups that are at the top are, first off, mostly Tucson-based. You again beat out Phoenix, awesome. Um, but they um, are a lot of animal rescue groups. It says something. And so you just need to bring that to people's attention. Well, it also says something about the level of activism of your supporters, because people will, you know, hey, you know, support this. We're trying to do this. And you'll see that you get these messages. I get them all the time from, like, Poland. I get them from everywhere. And it's animal, animal people are passionate. 
and we need to tap into that passion in all of these things. It's, and, and it supports everything that we do, including this kind of thing where you're looking to get uh, you know, a higher representation, then perhaps uh, we might, on first glance, assume that this is going to, that the animal component of all of the needs of a community are going to rise to the top. But because of the level of passion, the level of enthusiasm and energy, the animal issues come forward uh, very strongly. One of the things that community foundations are always interested in is growing their assets. And um, I have to tell you that this has helped us grow our assets really fast over a really short period of time. Um, we don't care if it's earmarked for a certain area or not. So um, that's one selling point for program officers in a community foundation. Okay, we had one more here in this room. Yes, next. Hi, this is a random question, and I'm just asking more out of curiosity. Do you know of any sort of coalition that has been brought together in terms of partnering with school systems and implementing some sort of a program or even a book at an elementary school age or any level um, to start training and teaching within the school systems at, at an early age, making that something that becomes a standard? in America? I don't know if that exists. Or... I don't know of any coalitions that do it. I know of uh, some organizations right. that do that sort of thing, but maybe No, Barbara... that's all. I just know of organizations that are doing that kind of work. In, in Salt Lake, Salt Lake County Animal Services actually has an elementary school program, and they go out and provide the information and literature, and um, it's great because then kids go home and ask their parents if their pets are fixed, right? So. Um, it's a great model, and I, something like that I actually think is great to partner with the government shelter if they're supportive and do community outreach, um, because then it's, you know, if it's public schools and the government shelter, they can generally work very well together. Some questions down here. <clears throat> Um, so I am thinking of starting something in my community. Um, I'm in the Philadelphia region, and people love to be opinionated in Philadelphia, so that's not a, it's not always warm and fuzzy. <laughs> um, but my concern more is that I'm in more of a mid-level group, and there would be some what I would call heavy hitters that I would need to get involved, I think, to make some impactful change. Um, so would you recommend really focusing getting them on board first or you know sort of trying but then saying okay well I'm gonna go and do this anyway kind of with or without them. So you're talking about PSPC, PS, uh, PCA and the... You'd see like PSPCA, ACT, PAUSE um, and then some even larger private rescue groups that you know I can't really gauge one way or the other how open they might be. I believe Sue, I don't know if Sue Cosby is still here. Uh, Sue she she just said, did you speak with her about any of this? I have not. I suggest you talk to uh, Mark Peralta, because Mark you know, was, the, was interim at PSPCA. He's now uh, works for Best Friends. He runs our NKLA coalition. I think he would be able to give you a good insight on perhaps how to approach that, because he's seen it from, you know, this from both sides and was the, uh, you know, the, the interim uh, GM or, yeah, or we executive did speak director. about it a little bit, but I was just wondering from your well, perspective. Well, I think, you know, it depends really on where the, what the I, I'm not familiar at all with your community. It's really where the center of gravity is, where the funding is, uh, what resources. I mean, I think it's, it's uh, the more, if you have a funder or as, you know, somewhere that, that, that can bring that clout and what, you know, why should I join your coalition? What's in it for me? So it's, there's always a what's in it for, for me. And if there's, uh, you know, resources, dollars, a funder, or, a, you know, uh, something that I'm, and, and of course there's lots in it for anybody, but, you know, th some of these things need to be uh, kind of crude, for lack of a better word. The uh, fact that, well, we're all gonna, we're all gonna benefit because we're gonna be doing good because the animals are gonna be, we're gonna save more animals. We're all gonna be able to raise more money because the public's gonna love what we do. That might be lost in the, as, as a future vision, but if somebody's actually there with, has the, the, the resources to, to help attract, that, and I think that's the kind of calculation you need to make. Or has the reputation. So who, who needs to be the one who calls the meeting? Um, and figure out who that is or the two people. And it can be simply, we would just like to have you learn about this. 
Um, and it doesn't have to be anything with a call to action or anything, just learn about it. And, you know, Tucson Electric Power really thought about, we have so many employees, and we know that many of them have animals. In fact, they track their um, volunteer hours that their employees do. Many of them were doing them at the Humane Society and at PAC and with local rescues. So they knew that this was a really important thing to their employees. So they wanted to come to the table to at least hear about the scope of the problem, and then they became, they became involved. What Tucson Electric Power does for us is that they print everything for free. Banners, you know, they can't give money, but we get, you know, stationery and all sorts of really wonderful things. So you never know what you might get out of a, a partner. Yes, and sometimes uh, the power company has done in, in, another, in Utah and also in um, Los Angeles for certain campaigns, you know, put a little note on the bill about whether it's uh, yeah. spay neuter or uh, participation in an event or, you know, so if you get those kind of people that are sending things out to the entire community, it's, you can use them for messaging and various other things. But that person who can call the meeting and just get people there, that's key. So when I actually went to meet with Jan Letcher, I was working for Habitat. So I was not even at the Community Foundation. Um, it's just that it was really important and she took the time to meet with me and I bought her a drink. <laughs> just saying. So <laughs> I that's don't, the key. Buy, and I, buy and I don't drink. drink. <laughs> I don't drink. I bought her a drink, I don't, whatever. Uh, so I live in Colorado, and um, we are an all-breed rescue, but we do predominantly pit bull mixes, probably I would say at least 70%. Um, and Colorado is a very high BSL state. Um, statewide, we have like the it, you, a law that says you can't be a BSL state, but mo like Denver and Aurora, the bigger cities, declare home rule and say that they're sure. allowed to do whatever they want, basically. <laughs> and one of the things we're looking into getting into in the next few months here is really starting to try and work with legislation and getting those overturned because Denver is growing by about a quarter of a million people a year and so you have lots of new people that come to us all the time and they're like we love this dog you know they have great homes they want to adopt and I'm like I'm sorry you live in Denver we can't you know adopt to you and so I was just wondering what your recommendation would be to you know get started get the ball rolling on talk, overturning talk to Lady uh, do you know uh, Lady Van Cabbage Lady, Lady Van Cabbage, and she's, she's presenting. Now. She's a, one of our legislative uh, uh, leads, and she's an attorney, and she's laser focused on uh, what we call BDL, breed discriminatory legislation. And uh, you know, we all are aware of the situation in Denver. Uh, it's something that we've taken various various folks have taken swings at, and so uh, it's very high on Lady's list. So. Her name, Lady Van Cavage, L-E-D-Y, and uh, her, again, she's a presenter, and she may be doing something uh, tomorrow or Sunday even, but uh, make sure you, you connect with her and pull her name out of the, 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 you know, the materials that you, you got in your file and uh, email her, so Lady. And, and feel free to contact me as well, and, and I can even coordinate with Lady. You know, being in Utah and the success we had passing um, the statewide ban on breed discrimination, um, I'm happy to strategize with you. It's, um, you know, one of those areas where it's interesting to see Utah <laughs> more progressive than Colorado yeah. on, on, on and, any and it's topic. The, it's, but <laughs> it's the home, it's the home rule, it's the home rule uh, loophole that it's the screwing the thing up. So the um, thing you need to know about community foundations, we actually have in our bylaws, we cannot be political. So, um, we had an issue with community cats, and it was really a big problem. We were, we were selected for the Best Friends program. The county was um, having some issues dealing with the whole concept. And so, I can't be political, right? So I went to see every supervisor and said, hey, there's all sorts of really wonderful things going on at the community foundation. We're doing stuff for foster kids and this week of scholarships and whatever. And we're doing this other initiative here, over here with animals. It's really great. And we're so happy and I've got some information for you, right? 
So then when the big meeting happened, you know, we talk about going to the big meetings and talking about the puppy mills and all that. The big meeting happened. I wanted to be there. It was really important. I could do the county. I could not do the city. It also went to the city. I do not live in the city. I, I'm in unincorporated Pima County, so I could go to that meeting. And I did sign up to, sign, to, to say something, and I talked about Gandhi and doing the right thing, right? So I was, I was following the rules of my place of employment, and yet I was there um, talking about this issue and, and encouraging folks to do the right thing. And three of the supervisors said, oh, Barbara, thanks for doing all the work you're doing at the Community Foundation, which was great. This is a group, one of these folks out of the five is a Tea Party person. The four vote, the fifth one always votes off. It was unanimous to do the community cast, which was really, which was really wonderful. But you have to be sensitive then to what um, folks can and cannot do. Um, and and they if they believe, they'll, they'll work it as best they can. So I think we have time for one more question. Yeah. If we've got somebody. She's from Colorado. Okay. Any, how are we doing on time? Like two minutes. Any final question? Any questions? Yes. Uh, let, can we get a microphone so it gets on the, uh, where is the mic? Um, I'm from Cincinnati, Ohio. Is this on? Am I being heard? Okay. Um, we have kind of, um, tried to form a coalition several different ways and several different times and so far have failed. We've worked with Target Zero and it has failed. Um, so a group of us has gotten together and we have recently started having meetings. The SPCA, the Hamilton County SPCA is involved along with um, both the directors from both spay neuter clinics. Is this like sounding encouraging? Yes. Um, yes. We just read our first PetSmart group grant. Um, the four groups that are involved. Um, we've already had two groups, though, that have dropped out. We just keep rolling forward is what I'm hearing yep. you say, though. We're... Yep. Yeah. Okay. And if you were able to, um, you know, formulate a strategy uh, and where you, you know, a vision and how you want to pull the thing together uh, and what the, uh, the goals and, and, and aims are, uh, just keep working at it. So just but, try and get more structure yeah, but, and yeah. bring groups in one at a time. If they won't come, we just roll forward and mm -hmm. let them go. Yes, and, the, and, the, and again, uh, if you have a funder, if you have some organization, it sounds like you have some significant organizations in there, keep it, just get that vision. What are you trying to achieve? What are the steps? What's the plan? What's the strategy? When you can start, begin to lay out those things and. They look, here's our, here's our year one goal, here's our year two goal, here's the how we're going to do it, here's what we need, and you start getting people to go out into the community and, and generate some of those resources, uh, it, things begin to come to life more, more readily. And be positive, right? It's always, we're moving forward, it's positive. And those groups that don't join you, don't, it's okay. Whenever you're ready, we'd love to have you. We would love to have you. And, and maybe you've done this, but I, Maybe I didn't emphasize it enough, but I do think having a written agreement of what your shared vision is um, and what you're committing to yeah. one another together, we having that not, written agreement so. that the organization actually signs, you know, then it, it, it's just that one step that provides more buy-in, so then it's not casual. Then they don't just decide to quit coming to meetings because they made a commitment to be part of this coalition, and that, that, that step, I think, is actually very helpful in, in allowing things to coalesce. Thank you. Thank you. And thank all of you for uh, coming.